I am actually not a real life Iron Man, but I can tell you about the people that are real life Iron Man. Uh, as I mentioned, I'm an associate professor in the School of Kinesiology here, and the research in my laboratory is really focused on building robotic exoskeletons. Um, and I'm going to talk to you a little bit about not only our research in our laboratory, but around the world, what's the current state of the art. Most of you will probably see Iron Man 2, and if you're not going to see it, I highly recommend it. They're usually, the first one was really good, and I suspect the second one will be just as entertaining. But I actually learned about Iron Man growing up. I had two older brothers uh, that bought a lot of comic books, and I would steal their comic books as a little kid. And, you know, truth be told, I learned a lot of my reading skills through comic books, including Iron Man. Um, and so I'm going to take this one opportunity, because supposedly my mom is back down in Florida watching. All that time and money I spent reading comic books has finally paid off now, so. <laughs> These are arguably the three most advanced robotic exoskeletons in the world today. Um, the top one by Professor Sankai in Japan is called HAL. Bottom one on the left, uh, exosystem built by Professor Steve Jacobson at University of Utah and his company Sarcos. And the one on the far right is um, built by Professor Kazaruni at UC Berkeley and his spin-off company, Berkeley Bionics. Um, the one on the bottom left and the one on the right have been financed by the military through research grants with the intent of helping our soldiers carry heavy loads, whether it be autonomously in Afghanistan or um, in bases where they can load heavy objects in terms of the bottom left one. The top one on the left, HAL, in Japan, is designed actually for individuals with disabilities, those that um, fatigue eas easily, have mobility disorders, and the intent is to give them a little bit um, better capabilities than what they have currently. Uh, I'm amazed at the technolo technological advancements they've made. But truth be told, from what we can learn, they don't quite work as well as we would like them to. And the ra reason is, in a way, it's almost like they're fighting the systems. It, it's not incredibly smooth and fluid yet, because it's like two people carrying a very large box and they can't see each other. They're trying to maneuver around the halls and they sort of have to react to each other. And that's really the state we are with exoskeletons, is we, we're not quite getting them to the point where we want them to be. And the rationale is that we really need to study humans and machines as an integrated system. It's not just engineers in a room that build these exoskeletons and come up with uh, control strategies that we think will work. It really comes down to we need to make sure that the biomechanics, the energetics, the neural control are considered as we build these exoskeletons. And we need to understand them as a, as a coordinated machine. Um, and we can't really do that. And to give you an example of how we can't do that, I'm going to point to a very simple mechanical <coughs> exoskeleton. Oscar Pistorius is a world-class athlete in terms of running 400 meters. Here he's pictured um, with his two artificial lower limbs. Um, he wanted to compete in the last Olympics against able-bodied athletes. And he was banned by the IAAF because they argued that he had an advantage over um, intact athletes in that his prosthesis were giving him an advantage that intact athletes didn't have. And so through an appeal process and some evaluation by the world's best biomechanists, he was able to overturn that ban. Now he's hoping to compete in the London Olympics. But the world's best biomechanist currently can't come to an um, agreement whether he really does have an advantage over able-bodied individuals. It's a very simple machine. They're just carbon fiber springs. But because of the way he runs with them, we really don't know enough of he, if he really does have an advantage. So our state of the art in how humans work with machines is a little bit lacking. And to highlight this, I'm going to take you back to 1997, when Gary Kasparov, the world's greatest chess champion, was built, was beaten by Deep Blue, a computer that IBM built. So that was a good uh, 13 years ago that scientists and engineers could build a machine that could outperform the world's best human at a cognitive task, a very complicated cognitive task playing chess. In terms of motor tasks, we cannot build machines that can outperform humans at a lot of motor tasks. This is arguably the world's best walking robot right now. Hanna Zasimo.
commercials. Honda has built it over a matter of about 15 years, <clears throat> not really because they think they're going to make a profit anytime soon, but because it's a whole um, media press hype in that if they can show they can build robots like this, it essentially shows that they have really good engineers and you should want to buy their cars. <laughs> but if you look at how good it is, it can run all of 60 minutes on one charge, its backpack, and it uses about 4 million joules. So that's about two Big Macs, if you want to put it in terms of kilocalories. Um, and its top speed is roughly about 3.8 miles per hour. I'm not going to compare that to the world's best human at locomotion, arguably Usain Bolt. I'm actually going to compare it to my five-year-old daughter. And my five-year-old daughter will run for the same 60 minutes on only 200,000 joules, which is two carats. Okay, so there's a huge difference in how efficient humans are in terms of locomotion compared to what we can build machines. And her top speed is about six miles per hour, so she can run rings around Hannes Asimov. And so we really are not at the stage where we understand humans well enough to build machines that can do their tasks. In our laboratory, we hope to understand the humans better by pairing them with machines. And the way we do it is we take artificial pneumatic muscles. They're just like specialized balloons. You pump air in them, they get short and fat, and they develop force. And then we mount them onto lower limb orthoses, braces for the legs. So these are high-tech versions of what Forrest Gump used in uh, the movie, when he was a little kid, they're made out of carbon fiber, polypropylene, some advanced materials, and we can basically add power to them. Um, when you use these exoskeletons, essentially we can connect them to your nervous system with electrodes by putting them on your skin to record the electrical activity of the muscles and the nervous system. We use that to control the exoskeleton, and we do it in real time. So essentially what we can do is make these super strong. Um, and we can do it at different joints. We've done it at the ankle, we've done it at the knee, with the hip, we've done it for the whole limb. It's a little bit easier to show um, what's going on in terms of the exoskeleton when we look at individual joints. Um, when you learn to adapt the first time, this uh, subject is almost thrown off the treadmill. And the reason she's almost thrown off the treadmill is because all of a sudden she becomes super strong. And she doesn't know how to coordinate that. And so we can study that whole training process in terms of how they adapt. And then when you take it away, there's this period of weakness where all of a sudden they forget how to walk because they have turned their own muscles down and then they have to rely on turning those muscles up. And we've done this in a number of different paradigms and we're working on this for actually rehabilitation after stroke and spinal cord injury with the idea that you can take individuals who have mobility disorders, they can't practice walking on their own, and if you give them exoskeletons for their legs and let them practice, does that then help them learn how to walk again in the long term? And in doing so, we can also do things like uh, measure your metabolic cost while you're walking with these exoskeletons. And so here's an individual who's got exoskeletons on each leg. Um, and by doing this, we can actually calculate what the relative efficiency is of her ankle joint muscle. And essentially, we get a number of about 61%. And we calculate efficiency as the muscle work over the food energy burned. That's pretty amazing because if you take the muscle out of your body, you have an efficiency maximum of about 20 to 25 percent. And so in your body, these muscles are working much more efficiently than they possibly can when we take them out of your body. And the whole reason this works is because in your body we have things like the Achilles tendon, which turns out is a really nice spring for a lot of reasons. It can store energy from one phase of the gait cycle and use it for another one. For a long time, we've learned that the Achilles tendon is really good as a spring during running, and that's why um, the cheetah prostheses that Oscar Pistorius used are essentially modeled on that same design. For running, we can quickly store and return that energy. It turns out for walking, you can do the same thing, but you do it a little bit differently. Instead of running like a poker stick, you essentially have a catapult in your ankle every time you take a step. You slowly turn the handle that stores up that elastic energy, and then right at the very end, you release it all. And that's how you use your Achilles tendon and your calf muscles during walking is that you're able to store up this energy and then get it returned just at the right moment. Okay, so the next step. What can Iron Man do now that we really need to work towards? And one of the things that I think we really need to get to is a cybernetic helmet. So <laughs> Iron Man can put on his helmet and he can interact with his suit um, in a way that he doesn't have to push buttons and he doesn't have to um, have a joystick out and control things. So he can just think about it and interact with his suit. So where are we as, in terms of scientists and engineering at getting towards that cybernetic helmet? 
for the last 10 to 15 years, people have developed these EEG computer interfaces, electroencephalography, where you put on a cap and it re records the electrical brain waves, um, and it allows you to interface with a computer. The downside with these devices has been that it's very, very slow in terms of the bit rate, or you can write about one to two, maybe three words per minute when you do this type of interaction with a computer, which is not a very fast way to communicate with a computer. Alternatively, there's a number of people around the world. Um, BrainGate is a commercial system that has been uh, initiated by Brown University, where they have a very small um, electrode array. So this is a close-up of that electrode array. It's essentially got 100 little pins that's very small and wired to an external interface. And they actually open up your skull, they take that electrode, and they implant it inside your brain. And then they interface through a connection in your head. So literally, they plug into your brain. Um, and here's a, a, the plug-in for this individual who's got these electrical signals coming from his brain and can control a computer. And they've demonstrated you can do things like play palm um, or control a prosthetic hand in this manner. Uh, the biggest downside with this invasive type of uh, control Scar tissue builds up. So after about three to six months, you lose that control, and you actually have to go in and take that electrode array out. Um, what we're working on in our laboratory is demonstrating there's a non-invasive way. And so this is me with 264 <laughs> electrodes on my head for a cap. Um, and essentially, we're using EEG, high-density electroencephalography, and using what uh, a signal processing technique called independent component analysis. And essentially, a, a good way to explain this is it's called the cocktail party problem. Imagine you're in this very large cocktail party, not unlike this room, and everybody's talking, and all of a sudden you hear somebody say your name. You turn and look, but there's no way for you to figure out what person in that room said your name. But if you've got 10 of your friends scattered around the room, and they all heard your name spoken, and they turn and look at the same time, you can do a linear approximation of where that person in the room was that said your name. And not only can you approximate it, but we can actually factor out just that person's voice. And we do that with this EEG technique. And so data coming out of our laboratory shows that in this very non-invasive method, we can actually isolate different packets of electrical activity in your brain. In this case, each color represents a different area of the brain that comes on for a certain task we're having people do while they walk and run. <coughs> and every little small sphere is an individual subject, and the big sphere is the average of all those subjects. And what we can do is not only factor out when parts of your brain are active when you're walking and running, but we can actually look at, within about 10 milliseconds, how much activity is coming out in these different areas. And so even though right now, what we're doing in the laboratory is to put these electrodes on and controlling these exoskeletons. I want to just take a second and make you think about what's coming in the next five, ten years based on this. The technology is out there to take everything we're doing in the laboratory and actually take it a very huge step. <laughs> People have built EEG electrodes that can go underneath your skin, on top of your skull, and record the electrical activity in your brain in the same way, but in a very non-invasive manner. So essentially, the technology is out there to take this type of control, <coughs> insert these electrodes underneath your skin so that scar tissue doesn't build up, you don't have to go into the brain tissue, and you can control exoskeletons that are in development out there, like this rewalk system that's designed for patients with spinal cord injury to help them learn how to walk again, and they don't have to push buttons, they can just think about it. So when I tell this to certain people, they actually get geeked up for a different reason. And that is, there's nothing to say. You can not only do this for exoskeletons, but you could do it for video games, computers, your car, whatever you wanted. We have a very short time frame in the next five, 10 years where we should be able to take these electrodes and provide reliable brain-computer interfaces for a large number of activities. Um, I worry less about the, the video games and you know, my eventual goal is something closer here. If we can get to Dr. Doom, that would be great. Exoskeletons, um, I, I think are really are feasible. And I, I want you to stop and think about this for a minute. Because the technology in computers has advanced so far, it's really this man-machine interface that's going to come around in the next five years. And then lastly, I just want to thank all the people in my lab that actually do this research and the sponsors for the research. Thank you for your attention.